Greetings, motherfuckers. My name is Sam. I'm a big doo doo head with a dumb face. Wait a minute, this isn't how it goes. Chris, did you write this? Yeah, you did, didn't you? All right, that's better. Today we're talking about the country that's so small it's also just a city. No, not Paris. Why would you think Paris? No, it's Singapore. It's got cool buildings, cool people, and cool food. But what thing does Singapore boast to have the highest of? Why are there lions everywhere? And will I be able to think of a third question to ask before I get to the end of this sentence? Well, boom, I did it already. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so sit down, sit down even harder, get comfortable, sit down again, relax, grab a dwinky, grab a second dwinky, these videos do get long, trust me, and get ready for 101 facts about Singapore. Number one. The island city-state of Singapore is actually composed of 64 islands, so that title's a bit wrong. The biggest one is the diamond-shaped Singapore Island, not the most imaginative name, that occupies around 18 square miles of this combined area. Number two. The main island's northern side is separated from Peninsula Malaysia by the Johor Strait, which is a narrow channel that's crossed by a road and a railway, both of which are more than half a mile long. Or a brief jog, if you're Jesus. Number three. Singapore is one of the only surviving city-states in the world. Can you guess what the other two are? There's no prizes available, but might be fun. Okay, well, the other two are Monaco and Vatican City, so pat yourself on the back if you got those. Number four. Its port is one of the busiest in the world and the largest in Southeast Asia. Located on the southern extremity of the Malay Peninsula, it dominates the Strait of Malacca, which connects the Indian Ocean to the South China Sea. This allows Singapore to grow and prosper. Number five. The city-state was once a British colony, but then what wasn't? Before it became an official member of the Commonwealth when it became an independent state. Number six. Before that, though, Singapore had actually briefly joined the Federation of Malaysia on its formation in 1963. It's always been a part of clubs. Number seven. The majority of the main island, around two thirds, is less than 50 feet above sea level. The highest point is Timar Hill, with an elevation of only 531 feet. Together with the Panjang and Mandai Hills, it forms a block of rugged area in the centre of the island. Number eight. Singapore contains a dense network of short streams, which may seem nice, but local floods are severe because these streams have low gradients and there's excessive water runoff from cleared land, so not that great. Number nine. The soils of the island aren't very fertile, but the granite lands are better than most. However, many of them contain strong layers that hinder plant roots and block soil drainage. Additionally, thanks to us humans with our exploitation and stuff, the soil there has extensively degraded. Number 10. Since the island is located in the equatorial monsoon region of Southeast Asia, Singapore's weather is characterised by uniformly high temperatures and nearly constant precipitation, that's a fancy word for rain, throughout the year. Number 11. On average, temperature varies from around 81 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 27 degrees Celsius, in June, to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, or 25 degrees Celsius, in January, i.e. it doesn't vary very much. It's pretty much constantly, you know, sweat weather. Number 12. Additionally, given the maritime location of the island and the near-permanent humidity, the maximum temperatures don't really go that high. In fact, to date, the highest temperature ever recorded there was only 36 degrees Celsius, that's 97 degrees Fahrenheit. Which, you know, I've experienced hotter than that. Number 13. Yet this doesn't stop the inhabitants of the island from enjoying a snowy Christmas. Snow City, Singapore's first permanent indoor snow centre, is a family attraction that offers a unique sub-zero environment with a three-storey high and 60 metres long snow slope. Number 14. It looks like Singapore has something in common with us here in the UK. And that thing in common is that rain falls somewhere on the island every single day of the year. On average, precipitation reaches around 95 inches annually. Number 15. The occurrences of lightning activity in the centre are very, very frightening. Well, that doesn't really work, but anyway. They're one of the highest in the world. Again, the humid climate is perfect for thunderstorms. On average, Singapore experiences 168 thunderstorm days per year. Number 16. Little remains of the original vegetation and animal life on the island. Still, there are a few thousand acres of evergreen rainforest preserved around watered areas. Beside that, many exotic plants have been introduced on the island for ornamental use only, i.e. just to, you know, look at. Number 17. And it's not like there are no animals at all. That would be, that would be really weird. There's still a good variety of species. The largest native animals on the island are the long-tailed macaque, which is a little monkey, typical of Asia, as well as the slow loris, a nocturnal lemur you may recognise for its large eyes, and the scaly anteater, also known as the pangolin. Number 18. 
There are also many birds flying around. You can easily spot the Indian minor bird, as well as the Brahmini kite, an eaglet with reddish brown wings and a white head and breast, and the hill swallow. They're all quite friendly with humans, which is lucky really, isn't it? Don't want a Hitchcock situation on your hands. Number 19. Over time, urbanisation has blurred the differences between city and country. Build-up areas now cover a large part of the city. Between the 1960s and 80s, the government carried out the conversion of villages into high-rise blocks with plumbing and electricity. This helped resolve the issues with land scarcity and hygiene concerns. Number 20. Today, over 80% of the resident population live in one of these high-rise blocks, and thanks to ethnic integration policies implemented in 1989, all the neighbourhoods in Singapore have a healthy mix of ethnicities and social welfare. Number 21. Singapore is a pretty diverse place as a result of considerable past immigration. The immigrant population is mostly Chinese, making about three-fourths in total. Malays are the next largest ethnic group, and Indians the third. Number 22. Oh, oh. Because of this diversity, the country recognises four official languages. English, that's the one I'm doing right now at you, Mandarin Chinese, Malay and Tamil, which I'm all not even going to attempt. Number 23. It's worth noting though that English is the main language taught in schools and is the one that appears in commerce, industry and administration. Number 24. Still, if you're heading there, it's good to know some Mandarin as it's strongly promoted as a second language and it's taught as a first language in almost one third of the school population. Number 25. On paper though, the country's national language is Malay. Like English, it's widely used for communication among ethnic groups and it's particularly useful to maintain close ties with Malaysia. Number 26. Just like with languages, there's a rich variety of religions on the island. Among the Chinese community there, two-thirds say that they are attached to Confucianism, or Buddhism, or Taoism, or sometimes a combination of all three. Number 27. Essentially though, most Malays adhere to Islam, which is the form of religion of about one-seventh of the population. Number 28. The Muslim population is around the same size as the Christian community, and it's growing rapidly on the island. Nearly all the Christian population are Chinese. Number 29. As we mentioned, Singapore is heavily urbanised, so it has a high population density. That means there's lots of people compacted into smaller spaces, like, I don't know, Rice Krispies in a box. But here's the thing though, its birth and population growth rates are the lowest in Southeast Asia. Number 30. On the bright side, the average life expectancy is high, while the infant mortality rate is low, which, you know, good things all round in my book. This isn't exactly a surprise though, because of the pretty good healthcare system over there and high standards of hygiene. Number 31. But what can we say about the country's economy? Well, quite a few things actually. As one of the great training ports of the British Empire, Singapore has experienced economic growth and diversification since 1960. Number 32. This helped consolidate the economy, which is the most advanced in Southeast Asia. In fact, it's even mentioned in the same leagues as other rapidly industrialising countries in Asia, like Taiwan or South Korea. Number 33. Singapore, though, has never really been dependent on the production and export of commodities. Instead, big investment capital from foreign multinational corporations is a lot of where the Singapore economy gets its money from. Number 34. But how did they attract all that investment? Well, what helped was a series of incentives, like the establishment of free trade zones. Number 35. Additionally, Singapore's production has been diversifying from labour-intensive industries like textiles to high-technology stuff like the manufacture of electronics and precision equipment and oil refining, although not much money in oil, is there? Number 36. Another important contributor to the country's economy is tourism. Once again, Singapore's location came in handy here. Situated in Central Southeast Asia, the country has increased its excellent air transport facilities and building things that people like, you know, like hotels and shopping centres. Number 37. In fact, that worked pretty well, because among Singapore's primary tourist attractions, there's duty-free shopping, which brings in a lot of people as well as various recreational attractions and a refurbished beachfront. Number 38. From the political point of view, Singapore is a unitary parliamentary democracy, based on the British model, just like your nan used to make. The parliament consists of 94 members, of those 84 are elected and 10 are appointed in terms of up to 5 years. The president is the head of state. Number 39. The Prime Minister, the Head of Government and the Cabinet are selected by the majority in Parliament. In turn, they form the government. Then the Citizens' Consultative Committee is designed to link local communities to the ruling party in every constituency. Number 40. Singapore's armed forces are divided into Army, Air Force and Navy branches. 
The army, which is by far the largest, consists primarily of infantry battalions. What a word, battalions. But there are also supporting artillery, armour, engineer and logistics units. Number 41. Military service has been mandatory for 18-year-old males since 1967. It lasts for two years, after which people become operationally ready national servicemen. The national service obligations end at the age of 40 for common citizens and at 50 for officers. The meaning of life. The two paramilitary forces are the People's Defence Force, composed mainly of reservists, and the National Cadet Corps, consisting of high school and college students. Number 43. Equally important to military service in Singapore is education. In fact, primary education, which lasts from six to eight years, is completely free. But that's not all. Explaining Singapore's elaborate education system takes a bit. So, a few facts for you coming up, okay? Number 44. First, as we've already mentioned, the primary language used in schools is English. Additionally, it's mandatory for all students to learn any one of other three official languages as a second language. Number 45. Once they've reached the secondary level, which lasts from 8 to 10 years old, students are placed into academic, vocational or commercial tracks. For those on academic tracks, there are 4 slash 5 more years of instruction ahead. Number 46. Then, whenever students want to pursue higher education, their academic performances are scrutinised to determine whether they're eligible for it or not. The process usually involves 2 or 3 years of pre-university instruction, followed by enrolment at a university or technical college. Number 47. Speaking of which, the largest and best known institute of higher education is the National University of Singapore, founded in 1980. Number 48. As mentioned before, the government actively participates in Singapore's matters. Another example of this is political involvement in monitoring the press to a certain extent that on certain occasions, it places circulation restrictions on periodicals and newspapers critical of its policies. Number 49. Have you wondered though where the name Singapore came from? Well, there are several different hypotheses about its origin. They all result in Singapore deriving from Singapura, meaning Lion City. It's the path leading to that name that tends to differ from legend to legend. Number 50. One of the most accredited stories claims that the city was named by Rajendra Kola I, ruler of the southern Indian Kola Kingdom, who attacked the island in 1025. Number 51. Others believe instead the name was bestowed by Buddhist monks, to whom the lion was a symbolic character in the 14th century. Number 52. Finally, according to the Sajaram Lehu, a Malay chronicle, the city was founded by Srivijayan prince Sri Tri Buana. He baptised it Singapura, following the sighting of a tiger he had mistaken for a lion. Number 53. The island was one of Japan's objectives in World War II. In fact, the Japanese did manage to land in northern Malaya and southern Thailand on the Malay Peninsula in December of 1941. They quickly gained air and naval superiority in the region and by the end of January 1942, they had overrun the peninsula. Number 54. Then in February of the same year, they crossed the Johor Strait. At that point, the British command, who was guarding the island, surrendered one week later. Singapore remained in Japanese hands until September 1945. Number 55. Since then, Singapore has been working on expanding and consolidating its land and economy. This was heavily hit by the global recession of 2008-9, but then what wasn't? It only began to recover from this in 2010. Number 56. Blah, blah, blah. Extremely important to that recovery was the growth of the services sector, especially tourism. The government had in fact built two large resort complexes that included newly legalised gambling casinos which opened in 2010. Number 57. In regards to Singapore's diplomatic relations with its immediate neighbours, we can say that they've been improved throughout the 21st century during which several agreements were reached with Malaysia. For example, territorial disputes and most concerns over water supplies and transportation found an end. Number 58. In 2006, Singapore and Indonesia signed a pact that established special economic zones on the island off the Indonesian coast. Number 59. Then, in 2010, Singapore was one of the six ASEAN, that's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, to establish an agreement with China for a largely tariff-free trade zone in the region. Number 60. And now for some culture. Okay, here we go. Not everyone knows that Singapore's national anthem is in microtext on the back of their thousand dollar note. So if you're caught short and don't remember the words, you better have a K on you. Number 61. And did you know that the red of Singapore's flag represents universal brotherhood and the equality of man, whereas the white symbolises purity and virtue? Then the crescent moon stands for a young nation on the rise, while the five stars represent democracy, peace, progress, justice and equality. Number 62. Buildings in Singapore cannot be higher than 280 metres, especially if they are close to areas with busy air traffic. 
Until 2016, only three buildings reached that height, equally sharing the title of tallest building in the country, the OUB Center, UOB Plaza, and the Republic Plaza. Number 63. The record was beaten by the Tanjong Pagar Center that in 2016 obtained special permission to build a 290 meter tall structure. Nintendo 64. But if you're not that into skyscrapers and architecture, then you should know Singapore has some pretty cool natural stuff in the territory too. Bukit Timar Nature Reserve, for example, holds more species of trees than the entire North American continent. Number 65. Oh, and there's also the Night Safari, which is the world's very first night zoo. It opened in 1994 and now features over a thousand animals in their naturalistic nighttime environment, living in the 35 hectare park. Number 66. You can also find the first man-made waterfall on the island. In fact, according to the Wildlife Reserve Singapore, the waterfall was built at Jurong Bird Park in 1971. About 100 feet tall, it's believed to be the tallest waterfall in an aviary to date. Number 67. It looks like Singaporeans are big fans of waterfalls since they also built the world's tallest indoor waterfall. The HSBC Rain Vortex, set in the retail and lifestyle complex of the Jewel Changi Airport, is 130 feet tall and surrounded by a lush indoor garden. Number 68. But aside from building waterfalls, Singaporeans have also come up with their own slang, the Singlish. It's a collection of colloquial phrases and lingo influenced by Singapore's multiculturalism. Number 69. <clears throat> Examples of Singlish can be adding exclamations like la and le to sentences, or the term chope, which means to reserve a seat. Also, Singaporeans tend to use the term aunties and uncles to refer to older strangers like cab drivers and stall owners. No free feet oh. pics, Karen. Oh, Number 70. If you are a true Formula 1 fan, you probably know this already, but for the rest of you, here's something interesting. Since 2008, Singapore has been hosting a series of concerts, racing and entertainment activities for Formula 1 fans every year during the Grand Prix season. Number 71. The principal event is, guess what, the Formula 1 Singapore Grand Prix, which has made racing history by becoming the world's first ever Formula 1 night race. As if that wasn't already enough, the Marina Bay Street Circuit boasts more corners, 23 in all, than any other circuits of the Formula One. Number 72. Another big attraction on the island is the Singapore Botanic Gardens. Founded in 1859, it has a history of over 150 years. It's a big deal according to UNESCO, which recognised it as a World Heritage Site in 2015. Number 73. Among its gardens, the National Orchid Garden is the most popular one. As you may have guessed, it houses thousands of orchid species, the majority of which have been named after visiting foreign dignitaries, such as Nelson Mandela and the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, and celebrities like actors Jackie Chan, Zhao Zun, and Bayong Jun. Number 74. We've mentioned briefly the history of the island, but here's something uncanny. In 1613, the city was wiped from the maps for a while. In fact, Portuguese pirates had reached the city and burned it down, and everyone forgot it ever existed. Number 75. Only a hundred years later, migrants from around the region started setting up in camps, raising the city from its ashes. Then in 1819, Sir Stamford Raffles established a British trading post, and word about Singapore got around again. Number 76. And today, if you look for Singapore online, you'll find out there's a lot more than one on the maps. There is in fact a Singapore ghost town on the shores of Lake Michigan. South Africa also has its own Singapore, a rural settlement in Limpopo. Number 77. The city has changed its time zone six times. From 1905 to 1932, Singapore was seven hours ahead of GMT. Then it moved 20 minutes forward from 1933 to 1941, and a further 10 minutes from that in 1941 to 1942. Number 78. During the Japanese occupation in World War II, clocks moved an hour and 30 minutes ahead to sync with Japan. When the war ended, the time reverted back, and ultimately in 1982, the country settled to sync with Malaysia's time zone. Number 79. Completed in 1910 and named after then Governor of the Straits Settle Merits and High Commissioner of the Federated Malay States, the Anderson Bridge had severed heads of spies and criminals hung around it by soldiers during the Japanese occupation as a deterrent. Number 80. The Kavanaugh Bridge is instead the oldest bridge in the country. Built in 1869, its original name was the Edinburgh Bridge, after the Duke of Edinburgh's visit. It was later renamed after the last India-appointed Governor of Strait Settlement, Sir Ulfur Kavanagh. Number 81. Today, Kavanagh's coat of arms and original signage still stand at each end of the bridge. In respect of those signals, the bridge is only accessible to pedestrians. No vehicles of any kind are allowed on the bridge. Number 82. 
Today, C-H-I-J-M-E-S, which stands for the Covenant of the Holy Infant Jesus, hosts one of Singapore's most aesthetically pleasing dining and entertainment venues. The neoclassical building amazes tourists with its intricate plaster work, as well as wall frescoes and Belgian stained glass windows. Number 83. However, as suggested by the name, the building hides a sad past. It was once a convent that later turned into a school, orphanage and refuge for abandoned babies and children. Number 84. If you're on the lookout for astonishing views, especially rooftop ones, Singapore is full of them. The One Altitude Bar, for example, is at the top of the One Raffles Place skyscraper. It's the highest alfresco bar in the world. Number 85. Speaking of world records, Level 33 in the penthouse of Marina Bay Financial Center hosts the highest urban craft brewery. Number 86. What about the culinary side of the city? Here's a funny one. The famous Singapore noodles, known as vermicelli noodles, stir-fried with shrimp, char siu, vegetables and curry powder, are not a Singaporean invention. In fact, the dish is Hong Kong's specialty. Number 87. Still, food options aren't an issue. Singapore offers a variety of tasty dishes. The pisang goreng, for example, is the local version of comfort food. It consists of small banana bites dipped in a light batter till crisp and golden. Sounds grim. Number 88. But if you're all about aesthetic and Instagrammable snacks, you should definitely go for the Nonya Kue. The food pays tribute to Singapore's rich Parankan culture, with colourful snacks both savoury and sweet. Number 89. Do you want to try something really new? Then just order tap water and drink. In fact, Singapore's Public Utility Board developed a way to recycle sewage and wastewater. Called New Water, the beverage is perfectly safe to drink. Actually, it's been tested and found to be cleaner than other water sources. Number 90. In fact, the final product comes from processes of microfiltration, as well as reverse osmosis and ultraviolet disinfection. The water is then mixed with raw water from the reservoirs and ran through the usual water treatment to produce tap water. Number 91. Anyone above the age of 21 in Singapore is placed automatically on the organ donation register. You can opt out, but if you do, then you're given lower priority should you ever need a transplant yourself. Number 92. There's a famous group of otters in Singapore. The Bishan Otter family and their escapes are often reported in the media. They have a rivalry with the Marina Otter family and the gang violence between them often makes the news. Number 93. Now it might surprise you to learn that Jet Li is Singaporean. The Chinese-born martial arts extraordinaire became a naturalized citizen of Singapore in 2009, reportedly so his daughters could benefit from the country's education system. Number 94. Singapore is said to have the second best passport on Earth, allowing visa-free or visa-on-arrival travel to 192 destinations worldwide. It's picked to the number one spot by Japan, who have 193. Number 95. It's illegal to not flush the toilet in Singapore, at least in public bathrooms. Failure to flush will land you with a fine, probably 150 of the local dollar, although it could be higher as a cool foul, send. Number 96. The crime rate in Singapore is so low that many shops don't even bother to lock up. In 2016, the Singaporean police reported 135 days without any crimes at all. Number 97. Although one thing that will get the police in action is peeing in an elevator. Since the 90s, elevators, or lifts if you're British, have been fitted with pee detectors which set off an alarm and lock the doors if you relieve yourself. You'll also pay a fine for the privilege. Number 98. Just going back to the whole Singapore being a part of Malaysia thing I mentioned at the start, well, Singapore was actually kicked out of the Federation. This gives Singapore the distinction of being a country that was made independent against its own wishes. Number 98. No, number 99. Around 90% of the land in Singapore is owned by the government, which builds a lot of housing for the population. In fact, 85% of the country's housing is supplied by the government. Number 100. If you want to treat yourself to the world's cheapest Michelin star meal, then Singapore's got you covered. Street food vendor Hawker Chan offers a $2.25 dish of chicken and rice that's award-winning. Number 101. In the 1970s, the Singaporean government launched a campaign to stop men sporting long hair and visitors who arrived in the country were told they needed to get a trim. As a result, bands like Led Zeppelin cancelled their gigs rather than get a haircut. So those were 101 facts about Singapore. Have you been? Are you there now? Let me know in the comments down below. While you're down there, give this video a like and subscribe to 101 Facts and become, you know, one of the mother factors today because it's a real party up in here, let me tell you that, for free. For free, I'm telling you that. So, in the meantime though, oh, look at these two videos on screen right now. You're going to really love them, I promise. And I'll see you there when you click on one. Please do. Bye.